You welcome that. I want law and order to be a very important part. It's a very important part of my campaign. Do you denounce them? Do you denounce them? I've always denounced any form, any form, any form of any of that. You have to denounce it. President Trump playing defense following that debacle disguised as a debate. He claims he's never even heard of the group Proud Boys, although the question he responded to that sparked outrage was about white supremacy. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups. Sure. Biden calling the president's performance a, quote, national embarrassment. Members of his own party voicing their outrage. I thought it was a, uh, an embarrassment last night to debate. The debate commission now vowing changes before the next showdown. But will the two other scheduled presidential debates even go on as planned? Vaccine watch. COVID cases surging in the U.S. on the rise in 31 states. A top health official warns we are witnessing the decimation of the Hispanic community. And what about the search for a vaccine? Could another country approve a safe one before the U.S.? Looming airline disaster, the deadline facing the airline industry if Congress does not approve new stimulus measures. Tens of thousands could be out of work as early as tomorrow. We hear from American families on the brink. Finding sanctuary. We meet the black families seeking shelter from racism and the barrage of images showing black Americans being killed. Why they say they have to create their own safe havens or leave our country entirely. It's part of our ABC News series, Turning Point. Alcohol and the growing concerns. Why more and more adults, particularly women, are drinking heavily during this pandemic, despite its inability to be an effective painkiller for the troubles we face. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. If you were one of the 73 million people who watched in real time, then you witnessed it firsthand. The presidential debate that careened off the rails early and never quite got back on track. Even in our deeply divided nation, many Americans do agree on this one thing, that last night's face-off between President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden was the worst debate in American history. The general consensus was one of disappointment. What was supposed to be a debate on the critical issues facing our nation quickly devolved into name calling interruptions and personal attacks most often coming from the president himself the very man seeking to lead the country for four more years but president trump defended his actions today including his failure to directly denounce white supremacists and militia groups last night and he also declared himself the winner and tweeted that the debate was quote fun now roughly 24 hours later we're taking a step back to try to digest what happened to examine the fallout and provide some of that context and analysis that we were supposed to get on the debate stage abc's mary bruce leads us off it's being called the worst debate in U.S. history, a disgrace and a disservice to the American public. But today, President Trump called it fun. I thought the uh, debate last night was great. We've gotten tremendous reviews on it. But lawmakers of both parties say the president went too far with his constant interruptions and insults. You graduated either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Don't ever use that word. Oh, give me a break. Because Joe Biden exasperated. I'm not going to answer the question Why because, you that because question? the you question a is, lot of the question Supreme is, Court justice, the radical question, left. Will you who shut is up, on, man? Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This who's is on your so list? right. Gentlemen, is, I think this we've is ended so this. He's going to pack the court. The low point of the debate and possibly of Trump's entire campaign was when the president refused to condemn white supremacists. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not add to the violence in a number of these cities as we saw in Kenosha and as we've seen in Portland? Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to do specifically that, do it? Well, I, go would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right so wing. So what are you, what are you, you what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists right. and right like me to condemn? White proud supremacists boys. and right proud, proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left. Moments later, the Proud Boys celebrating their marching orders, adopting the president's words as a slogan, stand back and stand by. 
Today, even Trump's allies on Fox News blunt that this is nothing to celebrate. But Donald Trump proved the biggest layup in the history of debates by saying not condemning white supremacists. I don't know if he didn't hear it, but he's got to clarify that right away. That's like, are you against evil? Um, why the president didn't just uh, knock that out of the park, I'm not sure. On Capitol Hill, several Republicans echoing Senator Tim Scott, saying the president needs to explain himself. I think he misspoke. I think he should correct it. If he doesn't correct it, I guess he didn't misspeak. Later at the White House, the president claimed he doesn't know who the Proud Boys are, even though Biden cited the group as an example of white supremacists. I don't know who the Proud Boys are. I mean, you'll have to give me a definition because I really don't know who they are. I can only say they have to stand down, let law enforcement do their work. But he still wouldn't denounce the group, so our Kira Phillips tried again. Mr. President, let me follow up. White supremacists, they clearly love you and support you. Do you welcome them? I want law and order to be a very important part. It's a very important part of my campaign. Do you denounce them? Do you denounce I've always them? denounced any form, any form, any form of any of that you have to denounce. On a train tour of Ohio today, Joe Biden with his own message to the Proud Boys. My message to the Proud Boys and every other white supremacist group is cease and desist. That's not who we are. This is not who we are as Americans. Biden calling out Trump's debate performance. The president of the United States conducting himself the way he did, um, I think was just a, a national embarrassment. What I saw last night was all about him. He didn't speak to you or your concerns or the American people even once. On stage, Biden tried to go around the president and talk directly to the American people. This is his economy that's being, he shut down. The reason it's shut down is because, look, you folks at home, how many of you got up this morning and had an empty chair at the kitchen table because someone died of COVID? But outside his stop in Alliance, Ohio today, some of Biden's own supporters told us they weren't thrilled with his behavior. So did you watch last night? I turned it on, but I got so disgusted I couldn't watch it. He needs to go ahead and act presidential. Don't allow himself to get pulled into these, these, these the pettiness. Trump protesters there, too. They weren't happy with how their candidate acted either. I think Trump underperformed and Biden performed better than I expected. I wasn't impressed, honestly. Both, both people were, uh, you know, they both let the worst of them come out. Mary, Bruce joins us now. Mary, we can certainly understand how there were uh, some disappointment on both sides last night. What's the Biden campaign saying now about how he handled the debate and what they need to do going forward? Well, I think the Biden campaign is pleased with the way that the former vice president they feel was able in many ways to sidestep some of the president's attacks, some of the gutter politics last night, and to try and speak directly to the American people. Over and over again, you saw that. Joe Biden looking straight down the barrel of the camera and trying to, to hammer away the issues that he feels voters are most interested in. That is going to continue to be his strategy going forward. Uh, look, though, there was no clear winner here last night, and I think both campaigns are aware of that, that this was simply a debacle and a charade of a debate, but the Biden team feels that they at least have a strategy here that they think works for them. It's one that you are going to see them continue to employ on the campaign trail and in the next two debates, although, of course, the next face-off is a little different because it's a town hall event. I think that will make it a little bit more difficult for the president to hammer away and, you know, beat the, the former vice president over the head with all of these interruptions. Things are a little bit different when you're speaking directly to voters and fielding their questions, Lindsay. Hopefully it will be different. All right, Mary Bruce, thanks to you. <laughs> and now let's bring in our chief White House correspondent, Jonathan Carl. John, the commission that runs the debates announced today that they plan to make some changes to avoid a repeat of last night. What are they saying that they're going to do? And, and how are the campaigns responding? Well, the commission has not been detailed about what they are going to do, although I spoke directly to one of the uh, one of the commissioners, and I was told that there are several things under consideration, including the idea of giving the moderator the ability to cut off the mic of a candidate if that candidate violates the rules. And we got two very different uh, responses uh, from the campaigns to the idea of imposing any changes at all. The Biden campaign has made it clear that they would welcome changes. They put out a statement saying, 
saying in part Biden will be focused on answering questions from voters there at the upcoming town hall debate under whatever set of rules the commission develops to try to contain Donald Trump's behavior. The Trump campaign is making it clear that they don't want any changes whatsoever. They put out a statement saying in part today the commission shouldn't be moving the goalposts and changing the rules in the middle of the game. Now the commission is making it clear that this is not about changing the rules. It's about enforcing the rules that are already there. And I was told directly by the commission that they are doing this. The rules will be changed. They will not allow what happened in Cleveland to happen again and that it will not be a negotiation. I was told if the campaigns want to make suggestions, that's fine. They will listen to suggestions, but they are not going to negotiate with the campaigns. They are simply going to announce the new rules. So that means we really could be heading to a situation if the Trump campaign continues to insist on no changes, we could have a situation where the next two scheduled debates simply do not happen. I think that is a real possibility. And, and so many people on, on social media last night saying just cut the president's mic. We also heard the president's defense of his comments today on those white supremacist groups. But you say that this is part of a pattern on, on how he responds on these issues. It really is. You know, the Trump campaign put out a, a series of examples of where he has condemned white supremacists over the years, and he has done it, but every time he has done it, it has been almost under duress. Uh, of course, he was himself uh, the person that was the main figure behind the birther movement, which was just a flatly racist movement. Uh, he eventually gave up that, uh, that, that effort, but he never apologized for it, never acknowledged that there was anything wrong with it. Uh, and I remember uh, very vividly when David Duke endorsed his campaign back in February of 2016. Uh, the tr Trump said nothing about it for two days. When he was finally asked directly by a reporter about Duke's endorsement, he said, oh, he endorsed me? I didn't know that. Okay, I disavow, okay? I disavow. He made it clear that he was irritated by the question and it was anything but a heartfelt disavowal. And then uh, the, the most crystal clear example was, uh, was Charlottesville. And, you know, we remember Charlottesville we remember that he said there were very fine people on, on both sides. Uh, but he did, at one point, before he, he made those statements, he did read a statement from Teleprompter condemning the white supremacists in Charlottesville. And I report, I wrote, I wrote about this in my book, he, um, he, he did that, he did the, his, his, his senior advisors basically browbeat him into doing it. And right after it was done, uh, he saw the way it was received and he snapped at his time top advisors and he said that he would never do something like that again. He thought he appeared weak. So this is this is somebody who simply has a pattern of having a real hard time saying uh, anything critical uh, about some of the most vile uh, uh, groups in this nation. All right, Jonathan Carl, thanks so much as always for your insight and reporting. For the last year, our investigative team has been tracking hate-inspired violence and the growth of domestic terrorism and its connections to the modern-day white supremacy, white power movement. Here's a sneak peek of our series, Homegrown Hate. You'll see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace like a monster that went into hibernation, and this was evidence that the monster has come out. The displays of racism and violence that we're seeing in the U.S. are certainly not new. It's a cancer in the fabric of this country. Part of this long legacy of people organizing over time. Within the white power movement, the Oklahoma City bombing stands as the culmination of decades of organizing. Timothy McVeigh has been found guilty on all 11 counts. He was trying to call people to arms and to provoke a race war. 
Kids are fair game, women are fair game. It's meant to be a battle strike. It's meant to incite war. You wonder if the clues that were there had been unearthed, whether things might be different. We were not sufficiently prepared. An act of domestic terrorism carried out by a movement that we have not classified, confronted, or understood. Save the white race! All we're doing is planting the seeds for future Timothy McVeighs to do the kinds of things we saw in Oklahoma City. There are going to be more victims. We have a problem in the country. It's getting worse. Are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups? We just need to start talking about race. There's no shortcut around that. And joining us now to set the record straight is one of the voices that you just heard from there. Former FBI agent Michael German infiltrated white nationalist groups and spent years undercover. He's now a fellow with the Brennan Center for Justice's Liberty and National Security Program. Michael, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. So you know all too well the threat that far-right extremists pose, something that the president last night again refused to denounce or, or even accept as a reality. He quickly made a comparison to Antifa, Biden arguing that it's a false equivalency. How great a risk do far-right extremists pose, and, and are we doing enough about it in this country? Um, we are not doing enough about it. Uh, white supremacist violence has been a persistent problem in the United States since there has been a United States. Um, and that problem did not go away. It's, it's from the time that I worked these cases in the 90s uh, through today, it's been a constant presence. Um, what we have different is a, a uh, president who's willing uh, to give rhetorical uh, sustenance to these groups. And, and I think that's extremely dangerous because it gives these groups the the idea that what they're doing isn't criminal, but rather authorized by the government. And of course, the failure of law enforcement to uh, address this violence as a priority is part of the problem. What was your reaction at the debate last night when he was told to denounce white supremacist groups and then he basically gave this call of action saying uh, to stand down and stand by? Uh, it's quite troubling because having spent time undercover in these groups, you know, they're used to, to listening to uh, dog whistles from uh, government officials that, that they can interpret in a way uh, that, that uh, they take as positive. But uh, this message was pretty loud and clear, um, and particularly the quick pivot to uh, what the president likes to call the, the primary enemy of Antifa. Uh, creates a, a problem because it, it, it is centralizing the focus of uh, these groups' violence, basically saying uh, the enemy of these fascist groups is the enemy of the president of the United States, and therefore uh, the, the likelihood that violence will be undertaken, particularly when we're talking about something as ill-defined as Antifa, uh, which is short for anti-fascism, and in fact, it can, can basically be applied to any uh, perceived enemy the president or uh, these far-right militant groups choose. Yeah, some have called last night's uh, statement a, a dog whistle into a bullhorn. But yesterday there was a hearing by the House Oversight Committee about white supremacists infiltrating law enforcement. Democratic Chairman Jamie Raskin said the bloody trail of violent white supremacy is now splattered across America, adding the virus of white supremacy is spreading. How much of an issue is this among local police? And while many communities debate police reform, what can be done to try and reverse course? Uh, so it is it is a persistent problem. This is something that the FBI has warned about from the time that I was working undercover uh, and in written products in 2006 and 2015. Uh, so it, it, it's a, a problem that's serious enough for the FBI to warn its own agents about the infiltration of white supremacists into law enforcement. Um, you know, I, I think it is a small part of the problem. You know, there are other types of militant act, activist groups that, uh, that law enforcement uh, appears to have an affinity for, or some members of law enforcement do. And particularly what we see in the deprioritization of investigating white supremacist violence. And, and we can see the... Oh, go, continue. 
And, and we can see the difference in the way the police show up to a Black Lives Matter protest or to the Standing Rock water protectors protest where they come in militarized gear and are very aggressively using uh, tear gas and less lethal munitions versus uh, the fairly light touch they bring to a white supremacist rally or a rally by one of these far-right militant groups that often devolve into actual violence against people, and yet you very rarely see aggressive follow-up to, to uh, prosecute people for those crimes. You can even see it in the, the language choice of calling some militia versus mobs. Uh, but that being said, what role do you think that social media plays in all this? I mean, the president said that he sees most of the violence coming from the left. Just last night, Fox News' Chris Wallace incorrectly stated that most of the protests end up in riots when, in fact, 93 percent of the recent protests in this country have been peaceful. How does social media play a role in spreading division and hate, especially among extremists? Um, I, I'm concerned that the role of social media can be overplayed. Obviously, all of us use social media more than we did when I was undercover in the 1990s because we didn't have social media back then. Um, but you have to understand that, that these groups uh, are often, these covert groups are often uh, early adopters of new technology. Uh, and are sometimes more advanced even than law enforcement is. The first time I heard the term email uh, was when I was undercover with neo-Nazi skinheads in the early 90s. Um, so wh while it plays a role, I think it's just as important to understand how the mainstream media plays a role in, in coloring the public perceptions uh, of these protests. and and. You know, not really acknowledging what law enforcement knew in the 1990s, which many, this is an old tactic far right militant groups use to go to areas where they know they have political opposition to engage in public rallies so that they can draw out their political opponents and attack them. And law enforcement back then was very good about making sure they were kept separate from anyone they might bring harm to, but that intelligence seems to have been lost in these recent protests, and that's quite troubling. Michael German from the Brennan Center for Justice, we thank you so much for your insight and your time. Thanks for having me. And be sure to watch our special hour-long documentary, Homegrown Hate, The War Among Us, next Tuesday at 8 Eastern and Pacific, right here on ABC News Live. Among the many pressing issues that received very little attention amidst the interruptions and insults during last night's debate was the dire state of the economy. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Treasury, Sector, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin met for an hour and a half today trying to seek a bipartisan compromise on a new massive stimulus. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said the sides are, quote, very far apart. And hearing those words, if you work in the airline industry in particular, it's got to be devastating. That's because relief measures that help keep them afloat are now set to expire tomorrow, meaning that tens of thousands of jobs may also disappear. Our Gio Benitez reports. They are the workers who have spent the pandemic in the air, at airports, or taking care of planes. But tonight, more than 40,000 airline employees are just hours away from losing their jobs. I dreamed of being a flight attendant when I was a little girl, so my dreams came true. Um, I have my dream job, and so I have been asking myself, like, what do you do when you lose your dream job? Where do you go from there? Um, I don't have any answers right now. Annette Halla has worked as a flight attendant for United for the past seven years. Her last flight was just a week ago. I asked one of my coworkers to take a picture of me. I said, this is my last time like putting on this uniform and coming to work. I wear my uniform with pride. I love my job. Her tears represent real worry. Just weeks before the pandemic ravaged the airline industry, Halla bought her first house. Past October 1st, my future is like a big black hole. And there's a lot of innocent people whose lives are being held in the balance. And we're all on a precipice right now. Back in March, the airlines received $25 billion from the U.S. government from the payroll support program through the CARES Act. But that money runs out tomorrow. The airline industry has been begging lawmakers for more, even taking their message to Capitol Hill. We must continue the payroll support program that has been the most effective jobs program of coronavirus relief, the most effective use of the public's money. And so on a balance sheet, Everyone agrees. Nick Calio is CEO of Airlines for America, which represents the major U.S. airlines. What's going through your mind? Thinking about the 
thousands and thousands of employees who are going to lose their jobs, their health insurance, the impact that that's going to have on their families. To those who say that the airlines didn't manage their money correctly from the beginning, what do you say? I would say that that is simply not true. The airlines, all of them, were uh, said to have fortress balance sheets. They had all packed in enough liquidity for an event three times 9-11. Three, three times. times. Worse, three times worse than 9-11. That all disappeared. By April, we were flying 94% pe less people than we had been on March 1st. That's like 1954 prior to the jet age. Air travel is down around 70% compared to last year, and experts predict it won't return to pre-pandemic levels until 2024. Now we're seeing how one family of airline workers is dealing with the cuts. The Ericsons all work for Alaska Airlines. The father, Lee, is a pilot. The mother, Brenda, is a flight attendant. Their kids, Kaylin and Sydney, work at the airline, too. And in hopes of saving their jobs, mom and dad took early retirements. Lee piloted his last flight this week, passing the baton to his son, who was his co-pilot. This is my last trip with Alaska Airlines. I've been flying here for 36 years, and I'm fortunate enough today to fly with my son in the right seat, Neil and Eric. Lee and Brenda say they don't regret their decision one bit because they get to watch their children fly the friendly skies too. An inspiring story, even in the midst of heartbreak for so many Americans, like Annette Halla, who worries about the future of air travel. This might be it. There's no guarantees in the future that we will you know, be able to come back, that life won't change or that I would be able to continue to do this. So yeah, I've thought about it. <laughs> And that recovery could take years. Gio Benitez, ABC News, New York. Our thanks to Gio for that. And last night's disastrous presidential debate took place as cases of coronavirus are surging in the U.S. New cases are on the rise in 31 states, while the U.S. death toll tops 206,000. Wisconsin is seeing record hospitalizations as the president plans rallies in that state. And a top official has now said the virus is, quote, decimating Hispanic communities in much of the country. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the very latest. Tonight, a record number of COVID patients straining hospitals in Wisconsin. We are nine months into this pandemic, and right now it's not slowing down. It's picking up speed. In one town, parents outraged after an assistant football coach stayed on the field after learning during a scrimmage that he had the virus. That coach later fired. And they can't believe that the coach did this. The governor, who has pleaded for national leadership on the virus, now calling on President Trump to either skip his Wisconsin rallies this weekend or require his supporters to wear masks. The president challenged about masks during the debate, saying Dr. Anthony Fauci had changed his position on masks. Dr. Fauci said the opposite. I, I want to ask you, you, we got said a little bit more than a minute left in this masks segment. Masks are not good. Then he changed his mind. He said masks good. It was seven weeks ago Dr. Fauci told David there should be universal wearing of masks. I feel that universal wearing of masks is one of five or six things that are very important in preventing the upsurge of infection. Today, Dr. Fauci pushing back against the president in an interview with ABC's Start Here podcast. So anybody who has been listening to me over the last several months know that a conversation does not go by where I do not strongly recommend that people wear masks. Cases now rising in 31 states, the Latino community one of the hardest hit, making up 56% of deaths in Texas and 48% in California. What we're seeing really is historic decimation among the Hispanic community by this virus. In San Diego County, Elvira Martinez was first hospitalized with the virus, followed by her daughter Cassie. The 29-year-old with no underlying conditions suffered two heart attacks before dying of the virus. She's my older sister. I'm trying to be strong. Never in, in my wildest dreams or nightmares would I have thought that this this would have happened. This, as a new CDC study, found a 55% increase in cases among 18 to 22-year-olds last month. 19-year-old Appalachian State student Chad Dorrell was reportedly healthy before getting the virus, later dying of COVID complications. Everyone says, like, oh, it's always the older people who it affects the most, but, like, he was healthy, and so, like, seeing that it happened to him, like, makes me feel a little more worried about everything. 
even some young people starting to have some pause now as well. For more now, let's bring in Eva Pilgrim. And Eva, there's a new forecast out about the risk for a fall resurgence. What does it say? Uh, those projections, Lindsay, are showing that the risk may be increasing in the northern part of the country much faster than originally expected. Researchers say that's because of these cooler temperatures combined with the fact that people are just tired of wearing masks and social distancing, but they tell us that there is still time for people to take those measures and to minimize more cases happening. Lindsay. And Eva, what's Dr. Fauci's advice about those who plan on or would like to gather for Thanksgiving? Well, he's got a couple of things he wants families to keep in mind. One, it, it, you really shouldn't be congregating if you can avoid it, but if you want to get together, one, try to do it outside instead of indoors. If you are inside and that you're with people who are not part of your immediate family, wear a mask, or if you can all get tested right before you get together and you know the status of the other people in the room, then you can take the masks off. But unless you know the status of the other per people in the room, then you should probably wear masks if they're not part of your immediate family. Lindsay? It'll probably be difficult to eat Thanksgiving dinner with a mask on. But Eva Pilgrim, our thanks to you. And when we come back, the judge's new ruling that impacts when the grand jury testimony in the Breonna Taylor case will be made public will explain why it was not released today. The African-American family is deciding to pack up their bags and move to someplace they feel is safe from racism, some choosing their own communities inside America, others leaving the country altogether. But first, the question, what happens if another country develops a COVID vaccine first? Stay with us. Sex, gambling, fraud, betrayal, and murder. Cutthroat Inc., the podcast. The a family truth. on a mission to find their son. A year's worth of conversations with the killer. Cutthroat Inc., subscribe for free now on your favorite podcast app. Friday, two music superstars. Do what you can. John Bon Jovi and Jennifer Nettles in an unforgettable GMA concert. John Bon Jovi, Jennifer Nettles. Friday on Good Morning America's concert series. Sponsored by CarMax. Back now with the latest on the race for a vaccine and how efforts here in the U.S. are starkly different than what's happening in countries like Russia and China, with some citizens there already getting injections, even though critics say not enough is known about their safety and effectiveness. So how will the international competition for a vaccine impact just what happens here in the U.S.? Our Bob Woodruff has this week's Vaccine Watch. The search for vaccines is accelerating in three powerful countries, Russia, China, and the U.S., where this scientific race has become buried in politics, including last night's explosive debate. Dr. Redfield said it would be summer before the vaccine would become generally available to the public. You said that he was confused and mistaken. Well, I've spoken to the companies and we can have it a lot sooner. He talked about the summer, sir, before it's generally available. Just like he Dr. said Redfield. it's a possibility that we'll have the answer before November 1st. It could I'm, also I'm be after that. In Russia, under the rule of Vladimir Putin, the vaccinations have already begun. By early September, over 400 Russians were voluntarily vaccinated. At least one member of the president's family. My daughter got the shot, he said. We expect, you know, tens of thousands of volunteers to be vaccinated within the next months. And then starting from October, it will be used for mass vaccination in Russia, again, on a voluntarily basis. Russia has moved so quickly because it skipped crucial steps needed to prove the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Russia has even struck a preliminary deal to sell its untested vaccine to several developing countries, causing concern in the scientific community. Were I in Russia right now, I would not roll up my sleeves and get this vaccine for the simple reason that it hasn't been adequately tested. In China, where COVID-19 originated, some companies are following suit, vaccinating citizens well before reaching a level of safety tests required in the U.S. and other countries. In fact, three months ago, the government authorized a COVID vaccine made by the company CanSino for the Chinese military. 
One of China's largest pharmaceutical companies, Sinopharm, claims most of its executives have already been vaccinated. But other Chinese companies, like Sinovac, say they're following stricter protocols. The biggest question here in the U.S. is, and also in the world, is when will you finalize your trial results and begin your vaccine production and your distribution uh, in China and around the world? We would expect that if everything goes well, we may uh, be expecting some results around the year end uh, of 2020. As of now, there are 10 vaccine candidates around the world in phase three of clinical human trials. One big question, would U.S. officials allow any vaccines tested overseas to be used in the United States? I think they would if we were interested and we were convinced that they were safe and effective. Obviously, uh, we kind of believe that our system in the U.S. is more rigorous and we would have to be really convinced that a vaccine coming from Russia or China was the right thing for our people. In this international race between powerful companies and countries, almost all agree it is still unclear exactly when COVID-19 can be stopped. Hopefully, in the U.S., vaccine approval could come this year. Widespread distribution in the spring. No guarantee, but I believe we can be cautiously optimistic that it will be available by November, December. It's not going to have all 700 million doses available at that time. That will take until about April. This is Bob Woodruff tracking the race for a vaccine. Our thanks to Bob Woodruff. And still ahead here on Prime, an update in the ambush of two L.A. deputies. The suspect under arrest, but apparently has been for weeks. So why are we just learning about this now? The NFL postpones its first game of the season due to the pandemic. And the new study about alcohol and its use during the pandemic. But first, our tweet of the day. Mark Hamill of Star Wars fame and his take on last night's debate. Mike Pence, Kamala Harris, the anticipation. We heard from the vice president. He's looking forward to seeing you on that debate stage more than anyone could imagine. Oh, good. Me too. Next Wednesday night, history will be made. The vice presidential debate on ABC. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, free on Apple Podcasts. Likely no surprise in hearing that the stress and disruption of this pandemic is making many reach for more cocktails than usual. Now a new study finds that alcohol consumption is indeed sharply on the rise in the U.S., especially among women. We take a closer look by the numbers. There's been a 41 percent increase in heavy drinking by American women during the pandemic, according to a new study by Rand. Heavy drinking means four or more drinks within a couple of hours. Put another way, one in five women reported one additional day of heavy drinking per month compared to pre-pandemic times. And on average, all American adults over age 30 are drinking 14% more frequently than they did before the pandemic, according to this study. With women drinking 17% more often than before, three out of four men and women are consuming alcohol one more day a month than they used to. And finally, with liquor stores deemed essential businesses early on in the pandemic, national alcohol sales rose 54% at the end of March, even as bars and restaurants shuttered, according to Nielsen. And we still have lots more to get to here on Prime. The black Americans fed up with the racial strife plaguing this country and deciding to create their own safe havens. Boeing 737 MAX jet is back in the sky, at least for a day, we'll explain. And our conversation with View anchor Sonny Hostin on our new book focused on identity, justice, and living between two worlds. But first, here are some of the trending stories on ABCnews.com. This is Montana Highway Patrol. And you're looking for a couple of missing teenagers. That's right. When the night Last seen in a red focus. Has come. The steering wheel is getting stiff. Lock the door. We're fine. No, I won't be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. Got ourselves a predicament. When the night Now could be a good time to have another baby. Are you crazy? I'm in love with you. Now that I said it out loud, it does sound weird. <laughs> I feel so Please stop. When I see 
you were so fine, I had to remind myself to breathe. I feel when I see you. Let's do this. How's your quarantine going? <sighs> I don't know who Proud Boys are, but whoever they are, they have to stand down, let law enforcement do their work. The president clarifying his statements during the debate when he was asked to denounce white supremacists and hate groups like the Proud Boys. I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say it. Do it. Say it. Do you want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and white like supremacists. White Proud supremacists boys. and right Proud, Proud boys. boys. Stand back and stand by. Republican Senator Tim Scott reacting. I think he misspoke. I think he should correct it. If he doesn't correct it, I guess he didn't misspeak. Did the president have condemned white supremacists last night at the debate? Of course, of course. I condemn uh, white supremacy, all extremist groups. He should unequivocally condemn white supremacy. My message to the Proud Boys and every other white supremacist group is cease and desist. That's not who we are. This is not who we are as Americans. Cases of coronavirus are on the rise in more than two dozen states, according to a FEMA memo obtained by ABC News. New York City is reporting its positivity rate ticking above 3% for the first time since June. The city ready to close schools as early as next week, if that average remains at that rate for seven days. If the schools are not safe, I'm not going to allow them to operate. Period. Also today, the city resuming indoor dining at 25% capacity. Having to close again. And I pray every day that I don't have to do that. Chicago also expected to increase its indoor dining capacity from 25 to 40 percent Thursday. The Illinois governor now has to quarantine for 14 days for a second time after a staff member who we had close contact with tested positive for the virus. They have some symptoms. Today, a judge agreed to delay the release of grand jury recordings in the Breonna Taylor case. Judge Ann Bailey Smith has granted Kentucky Attorney General Daniel Cameron's request for a delay, but only through noon Friday. Attorney General Daniel Cameron requested a week extension to provide those recordings and documents in hopes of redacting names, according to the motion he filed obtained by ABC affiliate WHAS. Cameron is under fire after only one officer involved was indicted, but not for Taylor's death. The manhunt for the suspect who ambushed two Los Angeles sheriff deputies and shot them point blank as they sat in their SUV is apparently over. And I can report today we have found our suspect. The LA Sheriff's Department announcing they're charging Deontay Murray in the case. He was already in police custody, arrested two weeks ago for a separate crime, a violent carjacking in Compton. The Sheriff's Department saying Murray has gang ties and a criminal record, including terrorist threats, burglary, and gun charge convictions. The disturbing crime caught on camera earlier this month shows a gunman approach a Sheriff's Department SUV and fire several shots at a 31-year-old female deputy and a 24-year-old male deputy sitting inside. We saw the worst of humanity. The NFL postponing its first game of the season because of COVID, pushing back Sunday's game between the Titans and Steelers. Three players and five staff members for the Titans testing positive, some reporting flu-like symptoms. A major test today for Boeing 737 MAX jet back in the air today. FAA Chief Steve Dixon at the controls for today's two-hour test flight. The fleet grounded following those two deadly crashes overseas. Boeing says it has fixed the flawed control system. The FAA chief saying he liked what he saw today, but the planes have not been cleared yet. Safety is a journey. Welcome back. The relentless barrage of images of black Americans being killed for some has simply been too much to bear. But what do you do? Where do you go when you believe that the place that you live is systemically racist? Some hope for change, some march for justice. Others, as Steve Osinsami reports, are simply packing their bags. For now, it's just a campground on red Georgia clay under the hot Georgia sun. We're to address things like violence by living in tolerance and love and being example with one another. But for the black Americans who are moving here, this is a dream. And we just want to welcome you to Freedom Georgia. Welcome to Freedom! We improvise in freedom.
They're starting small, 19 families so far who've pooled their money to buy these 97 acres of land about two hours south of Atlanta, their freedom, Georgia. It's their escape from what they say is the everyday racism that feels a part of life in America. Man, please don't shoot me, man. I just lost my mom, man. The final push, they tell us, came this summer. After seeing these images of black Americans being gunned down by white police officers and white neighbors. We came together and we said, you know what? We don't like being slaughtered in the streets. We don't like our children be at the, being at the mercy of some psychopath that wants to tackle us and, and arrest us and bang our heads. We don't want that. So how about we just come together and build our own? Renee Walters and Ashley Scott are the two women who started this all after seeing an ad for affordable land. Well, it was a post that went viral um, about buy a town for sale for the price of an a New York apartment. And so when I looked at it, I saw it had all these parcels and acres. This is by no means the first time where people who felt persecuted or unwanted have left a place to raise stakes somewhere new. Immigrants from Ireland, Italy, and Germany all moved to America to find better lives and created ethnic communities. It's why the conservative Dutch left the motherland in the mid-1800s and set up in Holland, Michigan. The tulip festivals and their windmills are important to the people here to this day. So we was on the road all day yesterday. But these are Americans who are already in the land of the free. The Browns are one of the thousands of black families thinking about building here. They drove down from Chicago on Labor Day weekend to investigate. I think that if we want to feel safe, secure, and be able to honor our culture, our heritage, and plan for our children, and not have to worry about what happens to them when they leave out the door, we have to, as you said, not necessarily segregate, but have our own. There are so many communities that have their own space, and it's not that we're anti-anything. It's we have to be pro-black love, you know? Kendra Field is a historian who underlines that black Americans have tried this before, and she says that racial violence is used usually the reason why. Nicodemus, Kansas, Eatonville, Florida, Mound Bayou, Mississippi, all the results, she says, of the black bodies that hung from the trees of their time. There's a, a really rich and long history of African-American emigration, uh, both domestically and also abroad, for instance, back to African movement, um, and uh, almost always in response to, in relationship to the history of racial violence and economic exploitation in the U.S. What do you say to people who say, you know, well, that's kind of racist to want to, you know, um, segregate yourself in that way, and that if white Americans did this, um, we would be saying that this is racist? I would just echo that, you know, how we think of these things, freedom, racism, integration, <laughs> depends on one's circumstances and the moment that we're in, right? At one moment, what freedom might look like is an integrated classroom. At another moment, um, especially under the threat of very real violence, and I'll use the, the words of um, that same founder of Freedom Georgia, she said we're looking for a safe space. And I don't think you can really argue with that. She's, she's, she's not arguing for... <laughs> um, segregation of the, of the nation overall. She's arguing for a safe space for a certain number of families that, that, um, that perceive themselves to need it, and I um, completely understand that. The professor knows this personally. She has people in her own family who started this black settlement in Oklahoma. Um, and then uh, <laughs> when that fell through um, and Oklahoma ended up looking a lot like Mississippi in terms of its Jim Crow laws, um, they were participating in a Back to Africa movement and they ended up um, helping to purchase a ship for $69,000 in 1913 and 14 and actually migrating to the Gold Coast, which is now present day Ghana. Welcome to present-day Ghana, where according to the International Monetary Fund, they've now produced one of the fastest-growing economies and where the success and safety here rank alongside several countries in Europe. In the last few years, black Americans searching for a real-life Wakanda started moving here in droves. Hello, everybody. Rashad McCrory. I'm from Harlem, New York City. 40-year-old Rashad McCrory runs a travel company and moved here during the pandemic. He says he's here living his best life and is not looking back. It's all part of the systematic injustice that put us in a condition where a lot of times we have to come out of America to heal. 
to be places where we're not always the, the victims. We're not always in protection mode. And, and, and being in Africa right now and, and relocating out of the United States, whether it's temporary or long term, I feel myself healing. I, I'm starting to see black people who are loving unity. That's some strong stuff, right? That you had to leave America to heal. It's like now I'm on the outside looking in. You know, like 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 what they say about a bad relationship. You're you're in a bad relationship, but you don't know it because it's all you know. For the first time in his life, he says he's not afraid of the police. Only in Ghana I have police friends. You know, in America, I refuse to have police friends no matter what the ethnicity is. And um and it comes from the system. I'm starting to see that people can have altercations and it and it doesn't have to turn into violence. That Law enforcement isn't, is, isn't a villain, you know? It's, it's, so, it's so many things that I'm starting to see in a, different, in a different light that's actually making me more of a whole person, showing me what reality is and actually showing how, at some time, diabolical systematic injustice is in America because it, it has us thinking all, all, all out of whack. <laughs> music, you know, when I'm listening to Ghanaian music, I don't hear, I don't hear anything about fighting. I don't hear anything about shooting. I may hear ganja, you know, marijuana in, in, in some of the songs and, and alcohol. But when I listen to my American music, this shoot, shoot, drug, drugs, murder, murder, you know, on everything, here, we're not hearing that on everything. It's a lot of things going on in America that's, that as Black Americans, we need to get away from for some time. You know, and, and hear what real, see what real, healthy living is about us. At the home site for black families in Wilkinson County, Georgia, Dr. Tabitha Ball and her husband, Greg Mullins, say they first need to build roads, get running water and electricity here before families can build their homes. And even though they currently live in a community with black doctors and black police, they say that moving here is still better for their family. We're not preaching separation. We're not preaching segregation. No, we just want to be safe. That's it. Exactly. That's all. We're not asking for anything else. I just want to be able to be live. Safe. Is that just too <laughs> much to ask for? Or just to be safe and happy. And that's what and this healthy. is stemming from. Safety. That's what this is about. They feel that black Americans in today's world are suffering trauma and that the solution for them is to get away. This land to be an example and an inspiration to other families that you too can buy land together and create the village that you want for yourselves. And this is our village. We are a village of families and we happen to be black families, but what we want is for all families to have and experience that same power of doing something together and building something for ourselves. For ABC News Live, I'm Steve Osinsami. All in the name of being safe. Our thanks to Steve Osinsami for that. And when we come back, our conversation with Sonny Hostin about living life in two worlds. Friday nights, 9, 8 central, true crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable, follow the clues, the hunt, true crime, 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source of ABC News. Breaking news, live events, streaming nonstop, original breakthrough storytelling from ABC News. National Geographic, ESPN, and it's all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere, right to you. ABC News Live. It's that easy to go there. Welcome to Disney Plus. Are you ready? Drop in and explore the action, the adventure, and the originals. There's no limit to what you'll find. These are your worlds. So come on, dive deeper into the universes you love, wherever and whenever you want them. You'll find them all here on Disney Plus. The coronavirus, everyone has concerns. And tomorrow, Dr. Jennifer Ashton is here, helping you better understand it all, helping you protect yourself and your family. Your questions answered tomorrow. On Good Morning America. 
Welcome back. And we turn now to a conversation with Emmy Award winning legal journalist and co host of ABC's The View, my friend, Sonny Hostin. Thank you so much for joining us, Sonny. Her new book is I Am These Truths, a memoir of identity, justice, and living between worlds. So good to have you on the show. So good to be here. So good to be here. <laughs> the, the world, of course, knows you as a TV host and lawyer, but, but your viewers may not know your background. Born to teenage parents, a black father and Puerto Rican mother in a South Bronx housing project. Give us a sense of how your childhood experiences shaped and influenced who you are today. You know, um, I, I was reluctant to write the book because my childhood experiences uh, weren't so rosy. You know, I, I always feel like I've had more failures than successes. Um, I was born uh, into poverty with teenage parents, but my life was certainly one filled with a lot of love. Uh, but our family um, really felt that education, um, education, education was the path to success. And for me, it was. And when you talk about that education focus, I mean, it was so significant and that you had many people in your life who encouraged you. I mean, even the teacher that said, you know, she's got to skip a grade, your dad, which like no school was good enough for, for you. And, and I think that's what, <laughs> yeah. what's missing for, for so many children. But, but as a young child, you, you, also your, your Uncle Ed was, was stabbed right before your eyes. And you write about the incident vividly. Mm -hmm. uh, you were the one who tried to tend to his wounds personally. But then you also witnessed firsthand that the police did not investigate this crime. Years later, you became one of the yeah. first national reporters to cover the death of Trayvon Martin and insisted insisted that the story get the, the national attention and, and coverage. How were those two events connected for you? And what do you think has changed in this current moment of, of so-called racial reckoning? Well, for me, um, the two, mo two moments are connected in, in a couple of ways, but I decided to become a prosecutor because I saw my uncle stabbed in front of me. Um, and I saw that he didn't seem to matter to the police. He didn't seem to matter to prosecutors. The crime went uh, uninvestigated. It went unprosecuted. And I decided even then, at seven years old, Lindsay, that I would be part of the solution and not the problem. And uh, I saw that happening with the Trayvon Martin case, that Trayvon was demonized uh, rather than portrayed as the victim he was. And so for me, I see now that black and brown bodies uh, are still somehow devalued um, and demonized. And uh, I continue to try to be part of the solution uh, and not the problem. And I try to give voice and perspective um, to the voiceless. And in your book, you also write about the crippling legacy of bigotry. And you go on to say, it's hard to deal with a near daily assault of outrages and injustices, microaggressions and outright abuse without wearing down. All that can take a toll on your psyche, on your self-esteem, on your soul. Uh, of course, the election is on many minds. And I and I mentioned yesterday a, a recent Pew study in our debate coverage that I really find fascinating. Only 9% of Trump supporters say that it's harder to be black than white in this country. And, and many may legitimately wonder wow. what makes it harder to be a minority, especially for someone like you, once you have, as you say in your book, ascended to the highest heights of law and TV news. Um, I found that uh, I've been discriminated against in my place of business. I'm discriminated against uh, when I seek housing. Um, it doesn't, I, I'm not distinguishable um, just because I am quote unquote successful. And of course it um, is, uh, it, you feel devalued because you are doing everything that is supposed to be right. You're, I went to school. I got good grades. I uh, am often the first person at work. I'm often the last person to leave. Uh, I work hard. Um, and you're supposed to be uh, treated equally and fairly. It's supposed to be a meritocracy. But oftentimes, you find that uh, the distinguishing factor that is factored against you is your race. 
And so um, it makes life um, disheartening and it makes it more difficult. No question about it. And, and lastly, we recently did a piece about who people who are equal parts black and Latino and that sense that society wants them to only check one box. What's your advice to young oh, people yes. who feel <laughs> caught between different cultures and identities? Or maybe I'll ask it this way as far as uh, that old cliche question about mm. what would you tell your younger self, your adolescent self who was, who was mm. running through the subway and being chased by bullies? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which I write about in the book. You know, um, I think that uh, we get to define ourselves because when you let others define who you are, um, that is, I think, uh, the biggest mistake, and that is when you get into trouble. And I, I would tell my younger self that I um, am, am the beneficiary of um, the hard work and sacrifice and dreams and support of my parents. And I certainly am uh, the wildest dreams of my ancestors. And I get to define my identity in whichever way I want to. Sonny Hostin, thank you so much. The book is available right now. I am these truths. Thanks, Sonny. Thanks, Lindsay. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. Take a look. This is what progress looks like. A customer sitting at a table inside Cat's Deli here in New York. Today was the first day here that indoor dining was allowed in restaurants, but at only 25% capacity, of course, due to COVID. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us, and good night.